Great. Thank you, Ron. Uh, so my name is Emil Lurch. I'm a principal consultant with AWS Professional Services. Uh, we help, uh, we're, we're kind of the human side uh, of the uh, AWS services. So as you, as you work with S3 or EC2, uh, you're obviously working with uh, APIs uh, with, uh, with us. Uh, we're providing advice and guidance, uh, hands-on capabilities uh, to be able to help you uh, uh, do whatever it is that you need to do uh, in AWS. For the context of, of this talk, um, I wanted to talk about some of the things that, that we help customers with in terms of um, modernization. Uh, and one of the things that I'll uh, also be talking about um, as we move forward is a little bit of uh, the migration. Uh, I know that you, know, you already had uh, heard some things this morning uh, around migration. I'm going to kind of recap that, uh, summarize it a little bit, um, and then get into uh, modernization because often uh, the two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, so we'll talk uh, a little bit about migration strategies. Uh, I'm going to keep that part brief, uh, and then we'll get into uh, some of the things that uh, I'm sure you're here to uh, to hear about today. Uh, containers, microservices, uh, serverless. I'll talk a little bit about uh, orchestration as well in terms of uh, ECS or uh, Kubernetes uh, as we move forward. There's a lot of content here, so I'm going to go uh, fairly quickly uh, through this, um, and especially the migration strategies. Um, and then I'll slow down a little bit more as we as we get into uh, more of the the meat of the containers uh, aspect of it. Um, so as Mahesh talked about this morning, uh, there's a number of migration strategies. We call them uh, the six R's, and uh, there's a number of uh, ways that you can uh, you can do migrations uh, into AWS. I'm going to be focused a lot on uh, the re-architecture aspect, uh, which Mahesh uh, touched on. Um, I'm going to go a lot deeper uh, into that aspect. But um, as we look at either uh, uh, going to a more cloud-native um, kind of refactoring of your application, or if we're looking uh, at a migration, in either case, we need to really look at um, how we're going to prioritize which applications we uh, we want to uh, we want to tackle first. Uh, so uh, we'll look at our app, uh, entire application portfolio. Uh, we want to uh, look uh, really along these three axes: uh, the business criticality. Uh, sometimes we want to uh, prioritize those uh, applications that are uh, that are quite critical to the business, uh, have a high impact, um, high uh, frequency of use, and a large user base. Uh, sometimes we want to take the opposite approach and save those to last, uh, give our team some, uh, some uh, experience as we move forward, uh, get uh, a lot of uh, other applications under our belt before we really tackle uh, those super critical items. So it depends a bit on what you're looking at from, uh, from a business perspective, um, if you want to hit that, that high value stuff first uh, or, uh, or save it to, uh, to the end uh, at, uh, as a way to manage your risk. Um, the second aspect that we want to look at is you know, environment priority. Um, typically, we want to you know, do changes to the application um, in development test uh, before we go into, uh, into production areas. Uh, and then the application complexity. If you've got a, a very complex application, um, again, I've seen customers here uh, tackle uh, very complex applications first uh, as a way to make sure that you know we can we can handle anything that comes at us. Um, oftentimes, though, it's uh, it's the opposite. We want to start with the simple things first, um, and then incrementally add on uh, complexity as we as we move through uh, our application portfolio. So each application that we look at, we want to uh, we want to uh, take and, and uh, analyze them based on uh, these six R's. Uh, so uh, Mahesh uh, showed a similar uh, slide earlier. This is kind of a different view of that slide. Um, uh, we've got rehosting, uh, which uh, has nothing to do with uh, with modernization, except that it actually does. Um, so uh, uh, most of the time when uh, we come in. Uh, and start talking to customers about uh, modernizing their applications. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they're already hosted. Um, maybe they're uh, hosted with another cloud provider. Maybe they're hosted on premises. Uh, sometimes they're actually hosted in AWS. Uh, in fact, last week um, I was just uh, in a situation where we did a rehosting uh, type migration from AWS GovCloud 
um, into one of the uh, one of the commercial regions. They realized they didn't re- they didn't need uh, the uh, additional um, certifications that GovCloud uh, has to offer. Um, and uh, GovCloud is slightly more expensive than uh, than some of the other regions. Uh, so we help them do a uh, rehost, uh, lift and shift um, into another region. And from there, uh, now we're starting to refactor that application. Uh, so it, it's very common uh, pattern that we see with customers uh, that we will uh, first do a lift and shift and get that application in the, into the cloud. And then at, at that point, you've got it in an environment that's a lot more flexible um, and easy to use. And so those refactorings um, can uh, go a lot, uh, a lot easier. Um, when uh, we do have some customers that take the opposite approach, uh, and they just say, we want to completely rework the way that we're uh, handling our, our application um, in terms of uh, a migration. Uh, so the best example that I have uh, of that is uh, a a couple of years ago, we uh, I worked with a company uh, called NWEA. They do uh, uh, they do K through twelve assessments uh, for uh, students in schools, uh, elementary and, and high school, because uh, they want to see how much the uh, the students are are learning. So uh, they um, they have uh, these uh, systems, these online systems that are uh, doing uh, doing tests for the students. And the students will take the tests uh, and they'll get a, a baseline in the beginning of the year. Uh, and then at the end of the year, they will, uh, they will retest those students and see how much, uh, how much they've learned during the year. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a, a, a very good cloud use case. Uh, you've got uh, very little activity during most of the year. Uh, and in September, August, September, and again in uh, May-ish timeframe, uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, a lot of spike in, in demand. And so uh, they took their on-premise uh, legacy application um, and completely rewrote it when they uh, when they moved into the cloud, um, taking almost none of the uh, the existing uh, stuff uh, with them as they move forward. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Um, but that, uh, that gives you a feel of the different, uh, the different types of, uh, of migration strategies and how they can uh, play in together. I'm going to skip this as uh, Mahesh has kind of covered. Uh, snowmobile, snowball, uh, you know, you've got storage gateway, other mechanisms to, uh, to move into, uh, into the cloud. Um, I will second one of uh, the points that he made earlier about cloud and tour. Uh, in professional services, we've had uh, many cu- customers uh, using Cloud and Door to, uh, with great success uh, in terms of a lift and shift mi- uh, migration. Um, we also have most of our customers are, are uh, continuing to use hybrid architectures. Uh, they've got on-premise uh, assets that uh, they still want to uh, have in place uh, as they continue to do uh, migrations, refactorings, uh, re-architectures, and uh, you know, at some point they may not need that, um, but uh, we we set that up. Uh, we help them uh, use Direct Connect VPNs um, to be able to uh, access their cloud resources uh, and and be able to use a combination of on-premise and cloud resourcing uh, from a uh, from an application modernization standpoint. Um, this is, is can also be a pattern that's uh, used in terms of uh, uh, databases. So uh, a lot of organizations have uh, large database servers that are on premises. Uh, they uh, need, they have multiple applications that are all accessing that database. Uh, and it can be hard to, uh, to start to decouple those. Um, and so they might want to move the front end of the, uh, the application into the cloud um, and have that application reach back uh, to on-premises uh, databases uh, while they work out a, a more detailed plan uh, for decoupling the uh, the applications, uh, VMware Cloud. Uh, Mahesh also uh, spoke about this. Uh, this is a little bit different picture of how VM uh, VMware Cloud uh, will work. It allows you to use uh, your existing uh, VMware tooling uh, to be able to uh, access both on-premises and uh, uh, cloud-based uh, resources. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here. Because um, what we really want to go uh, to is uh, some of these more uh, advanced type things. 
Um, so I mentioned refactoring, uh, but replatforming uh, is another uh, thing that we see a lot of customers doing uh, that helps uh, kind of springboard the, the modernization process. Um, and I think the best, um, uh, the best way to describe this is uh, a specific customer example. Um, so in this case, uh, and this is a fairly common thing that we run into, uh, we have an application. We just want to uh, lift and shift it, um, but there's some uh, really low risk uh, type things that we can do uh, as we, we lift and shift. It's not going to add a lot of risk onto our project plan. Uh, any change obviously is going to introduce some risk, uh, but we want to uh, start taking advantage of some of the uh, some of the benefits that AWS has to offer. Um, so this is a really low risk one, right? We can take a, an application, move it into EC2. Maybe we're using Cloud Endure. Maybe we're uh, just shipping it over on a Snowball or something, and and getting the uh, the code and, and uh, assets into EC2. Uh, but from the database side, uh, we can then uh, move that into, rather than Oracle on EC2, move it into Oracle uh, Amazon R R RC uh, RDS. And that way, you're taking advantage of the uh, cost savings from having uh, Amazon AWS uh, be able to manage the, the operating system, uh, the database software, um, you still get control over, you know, all the application uh, side of things, um, but the those underlying pieces are already taken care of for you, um, and patch management and all that is all handled by Amazon. Um, so it's a it's a really straightforward way um, to you know start to tinker with it a little bit um, and get some immediate value, uh, business value as you're doing uh, your migration over. Uh, repurchasing, obviously, we just moved to a different product. Um, and then what we're really here to talk about today, which is the, the refactoring and, and re-architecting. Uh, so in this case, we want to kind of reimagine and, and talk about things in terms of uh, cloud native uh, uh, type uh, um, type uh, architectures. Uh, but in, in addition to the technical architecture, uh, we want to also uh, think about all the other pieces that uh, that go with a, uh, that go around uh, working in a cloud native modern way. Um, so really it comes down to these, uh, these five uh, different aspects to think about as you're modernizing your application. Uh, the first one is uh, the organization uh, aspect. Uh, so at Amazon, we have what's called a two pizza team. It's a small team. Uh, they're cross-functional. Uh, they build uh, their systems. They run their systems. Um, and they have uh, uh, pretty much complete autonomy to do uh, to do what they need to do. Uh, so we will try to uh, enable those teams to go faster, uh, but uh, we really uh, want uh, folks to uh, think about their organizations as a, uh, as a way to uh, provide uh, business value by uh, delivering uh, a specific service. Um, so uh, developing that culture, uh, developing those processes, um, and aligning the people in the, in the right manner uh, is really uh, a, a big benefit of being able to move uh, faster uh, in the cloud and move uh, move faster, uh, actually, no matter where you are, um, but uh, specifically in the cloud, be able to uh, to move faster, be more flexible, um, and provide business value in a in a faster uh, faster manner. Enabling those organizations is a, is a big piece uh, as well. So if we look at a service team uh, within AWS or we look at um, you know, a, a small team within Amazon, there are two pizza team, uh, but asking them to reinvent everything that they're doing uh, as, they, as they build their service uh, is not very productive. Uh, so we want to make sure that they have springboards uh, to be able to uh, really take uh, the ideas that they have and move it into production code as quickly as possible. We don't want them to have to think about uh, what type of uh, dependency injection frameworks they're using or uh, logging uh, frameworks that they're using. Um, if there's something that has been successful for a lot of teams, we will provide that as, hey, we suggest you use this. Um, they can always make an alternate decision, uh, but if they take uh, the path that's already been paved for them, it's going to be a lot faster for them to, uh, to move forward. So um, using carrots rather than sticks uh, to be able to, uh, to quickly provide business value. 
Um, the third aspect is really the infrastructure automation. Uh, so we want to um, get as much of the infrastructure automated as possible. Uh, this will um, uh, eventually uh, lend itself into uh, being able to do things like uh, ephemeral test environments. Uh, so the idea that uh, your entire infrastructure is automated, um, now we can uh, create a, with, with one command, create a testing environment, test our system, and then tear the, uh, tear the test environment down after the tests are done. Uh, this can save uh, uh, quite a bit in, in terms of costs. Um, and getting those uh, automated tests uh, in, um, uh, embedded as well is also going to increase your velocity as you, as you create applications. Um, so it's going to, at the end of the day, also be freeing up those uh, developers um, to, to focus in on the code. They know that their tests are, are going to be uh, completed. They know that um, every time that the infrastructure is, uh, is created, it's created in the same way. So they're, so they're not being pulled into uh, production issues. They're not being uh, pulled into uh, debugging things in a test environment. Uh, be uh, just because somebody didn't follow a checklist uh, properly, or maybe the checklist wasn't up to date because something had changed, um, we we free up all that time uh, for those developers to uh, to stay focused and and stay focused on uh, the right things, which is uh, building the the new product. Um, architecture uh, evolution. So if we have uh, a traditionally built application, something we call a monolith, uh, which is where an application is just all built together, uh, it's uh, intrinsically linked uh, to uh, other components within the application. We want to start uh, pulling those pieces out uh, slowly, uh, slowly but surely. Uh, and uh, create microservices out of them. Uh, a lot of people have heard this microservice um, uh, buzzword, uh, but it's it, what it's really meant to do is enable you to uh, to move different pieces of your organization uh, faster, um, and that's going to move uh, all of your applications and products uh, uh, faster as as we move forward. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail um, in, uh, a little bit later here. Um, and then uh, last but certainly not least is this ubiquitous access to data. Um, so we want uh, our analysts uh, to be able to uh, look at uh, data that's coming out of your applications um, and act on, on that data. So as we build applications, uh, we want to create a feedback loop that uh, involves builders uh, building code, those, uh, that code gets tested, uh, put into production. Uh, we're seeing um, analytics come back, both uh, how, the, how the system is behaving and how applications are using the system. Um, being able to analyze that data um, in, a, uh, in a fluid manner and then um, get, uh, get that data or that analysis back into the feedback cycle um, so that we know the next things to go after from, uh, from a development standpoint. Um, so having that data available, uh, being able to uh, enable uh, folks to go in and look at it uh, through a, different, uh, a number of different lenses, uh, be it uh, operational or maybe we're looking for new markets uh, to go after or um, how do we um, expand our presence in, in our existing markets. Uh, we want that, um, that data to, uh, to always be available. Um, and not have to uh, worry a lot about if there's a, a small change made, what are the downstream uh, impacts um, to the data. So this, this is where we get into things like uh, the, the use of data lakes where um, you know, things are a little bit more fluid and, uh, and less structured, uh, but still able to, uh, to be analyzed in, in a, a quick and convenient way. So uh, to enable uh, to enable a lot of the this to happen, uh, we're going to be using containers, uh, especially uh, in terms of the application architecture. We're going to be using containers. Um, so the question really becomes: you know, what are what are containers, and and how are they used, um, and how can they be used to uh, to enable this uh, new microservice uh, world where we're trying to move uh, things forward uh, at at uh, various velocities. So uh, when we talk about containers, we really want to uh, try to remove a lot of, uh, a lot of the un uh, undifferentiated aspects of our application. 
Um, so things like the, the server um, and the guest operating system uh, that we're running on um, are uh, not, not what we really want to worry about. What, what developers want to worry about, what builders want to worry about is, you know, what is my application and what does my application need uh, in terms of dependencies uh, to be able to, uh, to operate uh, properly. So the, uh, the operating system, uh, the, the underlying server uh, is, uh, it, we've got a physical server. Uh, on top of that, we put uh, what's called a hypervisor. Uh, that hypervisor then has virtual machines and then each virtual machine um, can, uh, can run multiple containers. We'll have uh, images that are created in order to uh, uh, create containers from uh, so if we think about a, an image uh, in, in terms of cars, um, that, well, that might be a, um, a Corvette, right? Um, but my Corvette, it would be the container where, all, where Corvettes in general uh, would be the image, right? I'm going to pull a, a Corvette uh, from the dealer, and that's my, uh, you know, my car or my container uh, in, the world of, uh, in the world of containers. Um, we're... The operating system is going to provide process isolation uh, so that our application is isolated from uh, other applications uh, that are running. This is similar to a virtual machine, um, but we're leveraging the same uh, in, uh, for Linux containers, we're uh, leveraging the same Linux kernel. Uh, for Windows containers, we're leveraging the, um, the Windows kernel uh, and uh, a little bit more of the, uh, the Windows services that are uh, around that. Um, so. Uh, the advantage of that is that it, it becomes very fast. Uh, so uh, the first thing that we want uh, that we want to really enable, though, uh, is the is the portability. We tried this with virtual machines. Uh, virtual machines are are portable. We can create a virtual machine. We get a um, a, a large, very large file that contains. Uh, all of the operating system and application that we're, uh, that we're going to use, and we can copy that file around. So um, very similar to containers, they, they become portable. Uh, the difference here between a container and a virtual machine is that um, that portability is, um, uh, has much smaller files that are involved with it, um, and those are, uh, they are almost always described by uh, what's called a Docker file. Uh, which is a text file that we can uh, put into source control and uh, and version it, version it and have that uh, Docker file be attached back to uh, the actual containers that are, are running. Um, so they're much easier to deal with uh, than virtual machine files, and uh, we have that versioning capability as well. Um, this provides flexibility. So as we, uh, as we use uh, the, the Docker files, uh, the developers can just say, okay, I have a new dependency. I'm gonna put this into the, um, into the Docker file. Um, and then you know, other people can use, uh, it can build an, a new con uh, container image off of that, um, or we can use uh, container images from what's called an, uh, a container registry. Uh, where uh, those just get pulled down after, uh, after they're built. So there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how we want to uh, structure our processes around containers, um, and that makes it uh, uh, pretty nice vers versus uh, in a virtual machine world. Um, you know, th uh, these things are, are big and, and somewhat inflexible. There's no registries. There's, no, um, uh, there, there's typically not any kind of uh, text file that will describe them. Um, and that, uh, uh, that definitely limits the flexibility there. Um, speed is one of the things that really uh, speaks uh, well to developers. Uh, developers, uh, as they're building applications, are going to be using a lot of containers. And so we need uh, those containers to, uh, 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 to start in a, in a very fast manner. Uh, we can't sit around and, and wait for uh, the uh, you know, containers to, to take minutes to boot up. Um, because they're using the underlying operating system functions, uh, there's no uh, there's no boot sequence. You're just literally starting the application, um, and so there is almost no overhead. Uh, there is no no overhead for most functions. Um, there's a slight overhead. Um, it, it's not really perceptible, um, but there's a slight overhead for uh, in terms of networking, um, and there's uh, a, a very small. 
uh, set up time that that's required by the uh, operating system kernel um, in order to provide that uh, process isolation. Um, but you can start up a container uh, within a second and uh, that allows uh, developers to be able to start up a container, um, test something out uh, and then dispose of the container later on. Um, and it's a, it's a very quick process. So that then in turn uh, makes things pretty efficient, right? Um, during runtime, we've got very, uh, very low to no overhead uh, depending on the operation uh, that you have. And, uh, and we can efficiently pack containers uh, onto uh, EC2 instances into um, ECS or EKS. Uh, ECS is the Elastic Container Service that AWS provides. Um, EKS is the Kubernetes uh, the service that um, it, Elastic Kubernetes service is actually Kubernetes. Um, AWS is just managing uh, some of the infrastructure for you um, so that you can, uh, you can run Kubernetes. Um, those two services are, are, are what's called uh, orchestration services. Um, and so uh, as we start to try to manage um, clusters of servers that are all running containers, we need a way to, to manage how, uh, how all of that works. Um, and that's where ECS or, uh, or Kubernetes uh, would really uh, fit into your ecosystem. Um, it's, it's really about um, orchestrating which containers are gonna go where um, and how, uh, how those containers are, are managed. Uh, but the runtime uh, containers are, are very efficient. So, um, we're going to have uh, environment consistency, which is something I really haven't talked about too much. Um, but um, as we have uh, a container and the developer, you know, uh, is, is, becomes happy with the container, when we move, uh, when we use that flexibility to move containers from, uh, from one area to another, uh, be it the uh, developer's workstation or our test environment or uh, the production environment, uh, we know that it's the same uh, application, the same uh, dependencies uh, that are all packaged together. So we don't have to worry about, we moved this application into test and now something's broken uh, because we forgot to add uh, the dependency into the test environment. Uh, those dependencies just come along with the application. Uh, we've got one, uh, uh, one thing that describes um, how uh, the application and its dependencies are put together. So this consistency is a, is a huge benefit um, I actually have some customers uh, that are, uh, we talked a bit about security this morning. Um, they're, uh, depending on your security profile, um, you may be concerned about running uh, multiple containers on a single virtual machine. Um, you still get the advantage of environment consistency in, in that area. You can run one container on a virtual machine, make sure that you have you know, additional uh, protections from the hypervisor. Um, to, uh, to do even further isolation uh, than what containers provide, um, but you, uh, you're still able to take advantage of environment consistency uh, to reduce your testing cycle. Um, developer productivity, uh, they can be running a, a different uh, operating system on their uh, workstation than you know, what might be uh, being used uh, in the container. Um, so if they're <clears throat> uh, developing with Docker, uh, they can, you know, change from uh, a CentOS uh, uh, underlying base system to uh, an Ubuntu one by changing uh, a single line in the text file, uh, this Docker file that uh, that describes their um, uh, their container. So, uh, so this becomes a, a really big benefit uh, from a productivity standpoint. They don't need to, uh, you know, switch equipment and switch from uh, a CentOS machine to an Ubuntu machine just because they're working with a different application. They can just create a new container and and work with it that way. And then version control. So being able to uh, specify here's my change in the Docker file. Um, that change in the Docker file then uh, it gets built into uh, an image um, and then the two uh, marry up so that as we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, match changes in the system, um, maybe we had a, uh, a slowdown in the, in the request time um, and we want to see why. We can see, okay, here are the lines in the, um, in the Docker file. Uh, that was checked into our source control. 
um, and it looks like you know we added um, FFmpeg um, you know image processing into the, in, into this particular service, um, and so uh, as a result, we have uh, our requests have slowed down by by five percent because now we need to do uh, this image processing as an example. Um, but uh, having these Docker files in, uh, submitted into our version control allows us to do uh, analysis like that uh, to be able to uh, track down changes uh, uh, over time. And then operational efficiency. So uh, we can see this is the, um, this container came from uh, this particular image uh, it, in terms of operations. Uh, this image was built uh, with this Docker file and this version of the code. And so uh, we have full traceability throughout the system um, and it makes things uh, very quick to, uh, to determine uh, if something went wrong, uh, where it went wrong and be able to uh, remediate that, uh, that particular uh, issue uh, in a very uh, quick manner. Uh, we can also um, attach metrics and logging, uh, of course, but um, you know, these uh, uh, things, like, uh, things like what I just described there, uh, it really helps as you're, uh, as you're trying to uh, firefight some sort of uh, issue. So containers uh, then enable us really to get into uh, a microservices uh, type architecture. So um, as an example, um, I know that uh, uh, earlier today there was a discussion about Windows on, uh, on AWS. Um, I have a customer uh, just recently that uh, had uh, or still has uh, uh, Windows applications on um, AWS, and it's a it's a great example of exactly um, the kinds of things that uh, that we get involved with in terms of uh, uh, modernization and microservices. Um, so this customer has uh, applications that are uh, running on, on Windows. They're they're built on .NET. Uh, we did uh, that initial migration as a lift and shift. Uh, let's get everything into the cloud so we have um, the ability to, um, you know, uh, do some cost reduction over uh, what we have on premises. Uh, but now we need to uh, now we need to go further, and we want to enable, um, you know, unlock this other business value, additional cost savings. We want to Im improve the velocity of the team that's building these things. Um, and so um, each step along the way, you're going to see that, you know, we get some additional business value. So uh, first we do the lift and shift into the cloud. Uh, we get some, uh, some cost reduction. Um, the next step that we do is more, really more of an enabling step. And that is take our .NET applications and get them into Windows containers. Um, so this does a couple things for us, but um, primarily what we're doing here is uh, we, we get the portability and we, uh, we get the developer workflows uh, around containers kind of uh, locked down. And um, by putting everything in containers, now we uh, also have um, clear visibility into all the dependencies that are being used in that, in that .NET application. Uh, so once we, once we have done that, um, now we can uh, take a look at the dependencies, make sure they're all ready to, uh, ready to go, and we initiate a migration, uh, an application refactoring um, from .NET on Windows to .NET Core. Um, we're still going to run on Windows. Uh, we, we want to manage the risk as we, as we work through the project, um, but we, uh, we then you know, uh, take advantage of uh, the newer .NET Core technologies uh, and enable the, uh, the developers to, uh, to work, with, uh, work with this new, um, new code base. Once we're in .NET Core, an advantage of .NET Core is that it can run on Linux. Um, so now we can uh, take, those, uh, take those containers and refactor them um, to, and test them as .NET Core applications on Linux, uh, and thereby uh, reducing our costs again as we forego the Windows licensing fees. Uh, and then the last step is what we're looking at on this slide, which is um, now we've got a .NET Core application. It's running on Linux, uh, but uh, the entire team, uh, all the teams need to uh, work in lockstep. So if you look at the left-hand side of this, uh, this application, uh, we have, um, you know, everything's all bundled together. 
so if you have uh, your order team working on the order service, um, you've got another team working on the user service, uh, they have to wait for each other. And everybody needs to be lined up in order to get a release, uh, release scheduled. Um, and then you do a coordinated release. Uh, this slows down velocity. So uh, if the user service has, um, say it's uh, maybe an anti-fraud um, um, uh, enhancement that they want to put in, um, there's no user visibility changes. There's no dependencies on, on other teams, uh, but they still have to wait for, the, for that enhancement before everybody else is, is ready. If we can break that out and have uh, loose coupling between the user service and the shipping and order services, um, at that point, then the user service team can put in that, uh, that extra enhancement and not have to wait for everybody else. Uh, this pushes things forward a lot faster. Um, and that's really what we want to, uh, to move towards. So um, Amazon started doing this a long time ago, uh, and then it kind of got a name in terms of uh, microservices. But that's uh, the general idea is to allow all your teams to be able to move um, as quickly as, uh, as their team is prepared to do um, and incrementally add uh, business value without having to, having to wait. So um, if we have things in containers, that makes things a, a lot easier uh, to be able to, uh, to deploy separately and, and move things forward. Okay, so um, as, we, as we look at microservices, uh, right, we can take these, uh, these containers, uh, they're simple to model, we don't care about what, uh, what language it is. I just described uh, Windows containers with .NET, then we move to, uh, to Linux. Right. We can uh, we can create these um, these containers for you know Ruby or Go or uh, or Rust or um, you know Java or JavaScript. You know it doesn't really matter because it's just describing uh, the steps that need to be done in order to build the application um, and then to uh, to run the application. Uh, the container image um, you know has that versioning that's uh, that's there. Uh, th that's attached to the Docker file, and we can uh, have full traceability. Uh, and then we can uh, we're testing and deploying uh, things as as we move forward. This all then uh, really talks about. And I've talked about risk a couple times here, but this all really um, comes down to making sure that we can move at maximum velocity uh, with the lowest uh, amount of risk. So the uh, a typical container pipeline, uh, right, we have uh, IT operations staff that's uh, responsible for making sure that uh, our uh, our image has all the patches, uh, all the utilities that we want. Maybe there's security hardening um, that they want to have as a as a corporate standard. Um, so they would create a, a base image. We would have base images for whatever language we're using, and maybe uh, our caching uh, or or logging. Um, the nice thing here is that the application developer can just say, "Hey, I'm going to use um, I'm going to use that image, and then I'm going to add this stuff into it for my application." Um, and these two groups can kind of work independently from each other, so that um, as the containers flow in, uh, flow from the developer's workstation and test into uh, production, um, any patches that come along don't really need to be um, you know part of the developer. Obviously, we want to test them. Um, but the patches get applied to the base image, things get rebuilt, um, tested, and then um, can flow into, uh, into production. This comes back to, okay, so you know, in terms of business value, um, what, are we trying to, uh, what are we trying to achieve here? Do we really want to optimize uh, all of that stuff that we did? Well, you know, maybe, maybe we did and maybe uh, you know, that's important to the organization. Um, but we may want to, you know, just ignore all that stuff. That's, you know, that's work that everybody, um, everybody can be doing, and it doesn't really add any uh, specific business value. Um, so, is there a way that we can ignore all that and let uh, Amazon handle it for you? And that's really where uh, serverless comes in. Uh, if, uh, if we look at evolution of computing, we had physical servers in the data centers, then virtual servers, um, and now uh, virtual servers in the cloud. So uh, with, uh, when we move from physical to virtual uh, servers, right, we uh, can ignore the, uh, the physical side of things. If hardware uh, fails, uh, we can get that virtual machine uh, running somewhere else. It gives us some hardware independence, um, better uptime as a, as a result of that, um, and so on and so forth. 
Um, in the cloud, now we can trade in capital expenditures, uh, work, uh, work on an operational expenditures basis instead. Uh, we get to, uh, by and large, uh, ignore uh, capacity constraints because we just um, ask for another server from uh, AWS and off we go. Uh, things are more elastic um, and we don't have to worry about uh, so much about uh, maintenance, especially on the physical side, right? That's all taken care of for you. But there's still uh, some limitations, uh, right? Uh, we, we don't want to have to um, uh, worry about idle. So if we have a website that's got, you know, uh, one request per second coming in um, at, uh, um, during the wee hours in the morning, uh, we don't want to have to pay for an entire server to, uh, to manage that. Um, so we still have to kind of manage capacity and utilization, uh, even though a lot of that's taken care of uh, for you, there's still, um, there's still work to be done. Um, but if we can uh, kind of leave all of that um, to uh, AWS, right? We can, um, you know, we can take advantage of not having to pay for idle, um, having all that management, all the patching uh, of servers, all of that stuff coming in. Serverless doesn't mean servers. Uh, servers don't exist. Servers obviously exist, but they're all being managed by uh, by somebody else. Uh, you don't have to think about servers. Um, that uh, that's really the goal. And so we want to remove uh, all the operations management, uh, the provisioning and utilization, um, let somebody else kind of take care of that so that we can focus on our, on our business value. So I'm going to skip through this. Um, okay. Um, so that, that's really what we're looking at when we talk about serverless, right? We just don't want to think about servers. Uh, we want to um, have ultimate flexibility, um, let somebody else take care of um, all of that undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, so moving from on-premises into the cloud is going to uh, change our uh, capacity processes. It's going to change our cost models. Moving uh, into uh, modern architectures that are using containers and microservices, they're API driven. That's going to change our uh, operational processes and our development models to be uh, to be a lot more efficient. Um, and so, really, what we're looking for um, is uh, in that upper right hand quadrant. Um, things like Lambda, they're not using they, they're using containers and um, but they're they're not uh, customer visible um, type containers. Um, it, it Lambda also provides a, a workflow for you to, uh, to use um, that uh, we hope that can give you, um, you know, a maximum uh, efficiency uh, working in the cloud. Um, but container native services uh, might give you more flexibility if you're using multiple cloud providers or um, if, you're, uh, if you're doing a lot of on-premises deploy deployments as well. Um, and then you can uh, use some of the other services like uh, EKS for Kubernetes, um, ECS uh, or uh, uh, Fargate for either one of them. Um, Fargate is an interesting service to, uh, to talk about because um, it provides a, a way for you to just say, here's my container, I want you to run it, I don't care about anything else. Uh, and so that's a, a really um, a beneficial way to, uh, to utilize containers um, in this model, uh, in the serverless model. Um, so here's a list of all the all the services. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to mention here is that the um, uh, the storage service, right? So Amazon S3 is literally the first service that uh, AWS ever came out with back in 2005. Um, that was a serverless option. Uh, there's obviously S3 servers, um, but there's uh, there's servers that you don't have to worry about. You just know that I have got objects that I want to store uh, in the cloud. Um, and then uh, there's a couple different um, uh, slides, and I'm going to kind of scan through this. Um, but what I want to impress upon everybody is that um, when you move to these serverless models, uh, we see uh, drastic cost reductions. Uh, there's uh, some folks that you know might do math and say you know Lambda um, can be more expensive. Um, if that if that becomes an issue for your particular application, we should probably have a talk about that. Um, but the, the uh, benefits that you get out of um, using Lambda is reduction in, in terms of that uh, management cost and that never uh, paying for idle. And so uh, with NWEA, um, they had a drastic price, uh, cost reduction uh, in terms of operations uh, when they moved from on-premises into the cloud uh, because of the, the very spiky workload, they were never paying for idle. 
Um, is some of these other customer stories that, uh, that we see here um, kind of show that same thing. Um, but also the quick scaling is, an, is another factor. Um, NWEA literally goes from zero um, to be able to service uh, th thousands of students taking a test simultaneously. Um, and that all, uh, that all happens immediately. All right. Um, it's the it's the ecosystem that enables that concurrency um, that's very hard to achieve uh, using things that are um, not serverless. So, um, again, we see more scaling um, and then uh, cost. Right. So if we look at FICO, 95% uh, reduction in computation costs. I've got other customers that are kind of in that same vein uh, because, you know, the overall uh, development, uh, management operations, and uh, and runtime uh, of their of their system. Uh, they're not paying for idle. They're not managing servers. They're not patching um, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, I just wanted to reiterate this slide. If there's one thing to kind of take away from uh, from this discussion, uh, it's uh, looking at these five items as a as a holistic way. Um, to achieve uh, more business value, um, do it quicker, um, and uh, realize cost, uh, cost reductions at the same time. If there's anything uh, else that comes up after the talk, feel free to uh, contact me. Uh, my name's Emil Lurch. There's my email address and my uh, Twitter handle. If you've got anything, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to take them later. I know we're running right up against time, though. So I'll hand it back over to Ron.